Today's reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 4, verses 12 to 19. Suffering for being a Christian. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Good morning, Avenue. Hello, it's good to be, I say good morning, it might be the afternoon, evening, whenever you're watching this. Hello, it is good to be with you today. I hope you're doing all right. Now, I know that a lot of us Avenue Church are big fans of Lord of the Rings. Personally, I love the films and I'm really glad they've turned them into books, although well, they look a bit long, so I probably won't bother reading them. But um, I love them. I love the films. I think they're brilliant. And some of the criticism that's levelled at the films from people who don't like them is that they have these kind of weird false endings at the end of the third film. I think it happens like three or four times where like the camera, like the plot seems to resolve, the camera fades to black, you think you can finally go to the loo, and then another scene fades into view, adding more detail that you might not necessarily need. Um, again, nothing against them. I'm delighted that it happens. But that's one of the criticisms of the films. Um, it's a bit like those sermons that you might have heard, and that I know that I've preached, because Jamie's told me, where the, the uh, preacher says, and finally, and then goes on for what seems like three or four more hours uh, rambling on. Um, you think you're at the end, and then more comes along. And I think that you could be forgiven for thinking that 1 Peter, the letter we're looking at at the moment, is a bit like that. So back in chapter three, verse eight, Peter says, finally, implying we're coming to the end of the letter. But then in chapter 4, verse 11, we looked at last week, he seems to come to a rousing conclusion saying, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And that feels a bit like a brilliant finale, a kind of great final crescendo to end on. But then he carries on writing for another, what we have as 33 verses. And verse 11 could very easily be seen as one of these kind of fake endings that you get in Lord of the Rings or in bad sermons. Thankfully, though, that isn't what it is. And all the stuff he says afterwards isn't just unnecessary extra detail or pointless waffle. No, Peter is wanting to write vital stuff for the churches that he's writing to and for us to keep going in the Christian life, particularly when going through hard times. He's originally writing, as we've heard loads of times during this series, to a group of churches spread across the first century Asia Minor, all of whom either are or are about to go through fairly increasing levels of horrible persecution and attack. And so he's desperate that they and we, his, right, his readers thousands of years later on, do not compromise when we suffer. He is desperate to get that point across. Do not compromise when we suffer. Stay holy, which is something he's urged all the way through this letter. He wants us all to be ready for suffering if that's what living for Jesus calls us to. And so therefore to not sin or compromise when we go through it. You see, on the whole, I think people generally, well, they want to avoid unexpected suffering. Yeah, we're willing to maybe go through some pain or whatever for a goal we want to achieve. Maybe that's an exercise goal or a job. But on the whole, we want a life of comfort and happiness. And so that means that we're often thrown into chaos when unexpected suffering hits us. But Peter is wanting us as Christians to not be like that. He wants us instead to think differently about suffering, even before it happens, so that we're ready for it. And I think in the verses we're looking at today, you could summarise what Peter's telling us as, do not be surprised when you suffer for being a Christian, but rejoice and remember that God is making you more like Jesus. So don't be surprised when you suffer for being a Christian and 
as a result of that surprise, compromise in any way or sin or be tempted to doubt God's presence and love for you. Instead, rejoice and remember that from an eternal Christian viewpoint, God is using suffering to make us more like Jesus. Now, there's a lot in that sentence, so we're going to break that down into two parts, but the second part, there's extra bits in there. So firstly, in verse 12, Peter tells us, do not be surprised when you suffer for being a Christian. Verse 12, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that's come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Don't be surprised. I mean, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Don't act like this is something unusual and like you weren't expecting this. I mean, Peter's already said similar things in this letter. As Christians, we should be prepared for suffering and we shouldn't be surprised by suffering because that's what being a Christian is. It's a call to suffer. Peter would have been there and heard Jesus's words in John 15 verse 20. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. You see, if we're Christians, if we're wanting to follow Jesus, we should expect suffering to happen. I mean, just imagine, imagine a rugby player in a Six Nations game who wasn't ready for what was about to come at him at all. Imagine him getting the ball in the first few minutes and then getting absolutely smashed by some 22 stone mountain. If he's not expecting that to happen, he isn't going to cope. And it's going to stop him from being able to play the game at all. And it's definitely going to make him afraid of getting the ball again. And so that's going to affect the rest of the team. And we'd also think he was crazy for not being prepared what was for what was clearly going to happen. However, if he is ready, and if he is expecting it, well, he's going to be a better rugby player, isn't he? He'll be ready for the hit, and then he can get up and carry on playing. Or maybe avoid the hit. Or maybe take the hit better. And so in the same way, you and I, we need to expect and be ready for suffering for following Jesus. But to be clear, Peter's not talking about all suffering that we go through here. He's specifically talking about suffering that happens as a result of living in obedience to Jesus. What he isn't talking about is the suffering that comes as a direct result of our own sin and foolishness and disobedience. That's what the verse 15 is all about. So if we suffer for being a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, or even just for meddling in things we've got no business in, well, in truth, we deserve that suffering, don't we? And what we need to do there is to repent of sin rather than rejoice. So Peter's not talking about suffering we deserve. He's talking about undeserved, unjust suffering that will come as a result of living wholeheartedly for Jesus. So that means it's important that when we go through suffering of any kind, that we need to be prepared to each evaluate honestly and assess, have we done anything we shouldn't that might have caused this suffering in our lives? Have we been unwise or rash or foolish or just not made sensible decisions that might have led to this suffering? If that's the case, then we need to repent and we need to be willing to repent and quick to repent. But it is very possible the, the answer to those questions might be no. Our suffering may very well not be directly related to our own disobedience or foolishness. And it is that suffering, the suffering that comes directly as a result of living wholeheartedly for Jesus in this world, that Peter's talking about. And that he tells us to be ready for and to expect and to, as we'll see in a bit, rejoice in. Because suffering's going to come. And that means we need to be honest and talk about it bluntly. Suffering and following Jesus, just go, they go hand in hand. And so we're not to be surprised by it. And we're not even necessarily to try and run away from it, but we are to be ready and prepared for it. Suffering for following Jesus is what Richard called the way of the cross just before Christmas. Because following Jesus will always involve suffering. And for a lot of us, that maybe feels a little bit more real than normal at the moment. The price of obeying our government's lockdown restrictions, whether we agree with them or not, is causing almost all of us, I imagine, to suffer in one way or other. Even if we might describe that suffering as only mild 
I suspect we're going to see more of the painful effects of lockdown as they eventually lift. This really is a brutal time for loads of people in different ways. And so that means if we're all to expect suffering and we're confident most of us are going through suffering at the moment, if you're in touch with a Christian this week, encourage them. Encourage them. Let's go out of our way, in fact, to encourage other Christians at the moment. We all really desperately need encouraging. And I don't just mean a generic text saying, thinking of you. Let's think about how we can actively send Bible verses or gifts we can give to people or ways we can be thoughtful to encourage other people in our church family. All of us need it from the newest Christian to the oldest. Whether you're a member of staff or not, we need encouragement. The American pastor and writer Ray Ortland says it like this. I've never met anyone too encouraged. Never once. So let's be a church family, particularly this week, that encourages each other and goes out of its way to sacrificially encourage each other. What can you do this week to encourage someone else? How can you do that in a creative and personal way? We should expect suffering as Christians, so we all need encouragement. But if we're to expect suffering, Peter, instead of want us being surprised by suffering, Peter wants us to think differently about it now before it happens. And he wants us to look at suffering from a different perspective, to see God's perspective on what's going on and God's hand in it all. And so secondly, Peter wants us to rejoice and remember that God is making us more like Jesus. Rejoice. Now that might sound cold and heartless and like I'm trying to encourage some form of stiff upper lip stoicism and pretending everything's fine when your world's falling apart. Or you might read the word in the passage and think that clearly Peter never suffered that much if that's how he tells people to react and be ready for it. But neither of those are true. I'm not calling and Peter isn't calling us to a, a grin and bear it smile while your heart is breaking religion. But instead what this is a call to is to not forget in the middle of whatever pain, hurt, suffering fiery ordeal we find ourselves in to not forget the heavenly perspective of what is really going on when we suffer for following Jesus to not forget that this life isn't the end of the story and that this life isn't the true perspective on the story so the question is how how on earth can we rejoice in the middle of a fiery trial or ordeal or pain or hurt well, I think to answer that, we need to be clear what rejoicing is. And we need to know that what it doesn't mean is that we have to enjoy the suffering. You see, rejoicing and enjoyment are not necessarily the same thing. Obviously, they, they can be linked and often are. But no, instead, rejoicing means having a certain confidence and trust and knowledge that God is with us in the situation, no matter how difficult it is. And that he's doing something through it, no matter what. It's the reaction of a heart that sees through faith what eyes can never see. It means we never need to give away to complete despair and hopelessness. And it means we can give thanks to God, no matter what's happening to us. And it isn't just knowing that there might be a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's knowing that there's a light in the tunnel with us now, no matter how dark it feels. It's faith. Rejoicing is exercising faith in the middle of suffering. And so in these verses, Peter wants to give us four reasons to rejoice in the middle of our suffering. Four ways God is using this suffering to make us more like Jesus. And the first reason he tells us to rejoice is because we share in Christ's suffering. Because we share in Christ's suffering. Verse 13. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Rejoice in the truth that when we suffer for being a Christian, we're sharing, we're taking part in and with the sufferings of Jesus. I mean, it seems counterintuitive, but all through the New Testament, we see loads and loads of examples of increased suffering leading to increased rejoicing. I mean, Peter himself is a great example. Look at Acts 5, where the apostles, including Peter, are thrown into jail for teaching about Jesus. They're then miraculously released before being re-arrested the next day, then threatened with death before all being flogged, which wouldn't have been pleasant, 
and then let go. And in verse 41 of Acts 5, it says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they'd been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. You see, and in verse 13, what Peter's trying to persuade us is that when we suffer, it isn't pointless and that we're not alone in the suffering and that it isn't something that should surprise us. We can rejoice because viewing it from the perspective of heaven, suffering for Christ is a way in which we share in Christ's suffering, that we take part in something that uniquely binds us to Jesus. And it, it confirms in a unique way that we really are following him and we really are part of the people that Peter's described earlier. And so Peter wants to remind us that rejoicing, trusting God in the middle of suffering now is a little a foretaste, an aperitif, a taster, a starter, if you like, of that one day great rejoicing that we'll know when Jesus comes back to finally make all things new. Look at the second half of verse 13. Rejoicing as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Now that, that's hard to imagine sometimes. And it's difficult to get our heads around now how we can have this perspective when we suffer. So we might know from our own experience, suffering hurts. But like that rugby player I mentioned earlier, the tackles hurt. But knowing that we're on the same team as Christ is to be an encouragement to rejoice that we're on the right team and the winning team. And that makes it worth it. And we rejoice in sharing in Christ's suffering with his people here and now, knowing that that will lead to sharing in Christ's rejoicing with his people when he comes again. Don't forget heaven. Don't forget eternity, because this suffering is not the end, and this suffering will one day end. So we can rejoice that we get to share in Christ's suffering here and now as a foretaste in sharing of his joy to come. This is good news that you and I need reminding of all the time. We share in the sufferings of Christ in the same way we'll share in his glory one day. So when we suffer here and now, remember we're sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And that's a reason to rejoice. But the next reason Peter gives us to rejoice when we suffer is because God is working in us through it. God is working in us through it. Verse 14, if you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you're insulted, he starts this verse with, and the original readers of this letter are about to be more than just insulted. They're about to be vilified, persecuted, attacked, slaughtered, all because they refuse to deny Jesus as Lord. And Peter says, when that happens, they and we, a blessed blessed i mean that doesn't seem like a blessing does it it doesn't feel like a blessing often either but from the different perspective that peter's wanting us to remember he wants us to see that when we suffer for the sake of living for jesus it is a blessing even when it doesn't feel like it have a think of jacob back in genesis 32 by obeying god he's on his way back to meet his brother esau who promised to kill him if he ever saw him again and he sent everything that he owns and everyone he loves ahead of him to try and placate Esau. And he is completely alone for a night. And suddenly, from nowhere, someone begins to wrestle with him. And they wrestle with him, it seems, all night long. Now, we know how this story ends, a lot of us. But when this strange man begins to wrestle with Jacob in the middle of the night, I'm fairly certain that the first thing Jacob thought was not, Oh, brilliant, a blessing! I can't imagine the thoughts that went through his head at that point. But this horrifying wrestle led to a huge blessing and change given to him by God. And Peter wants to encourage us to remember that perspective now for when the wrestles leap out at us. And specifically, he wants to remind us, verse 14, that when we suffer, the spirit of glory and of God rests on us. Meaning that in the middle of our suffering, the Holy Spirit is in us and rests on us and is doing something in us through all of the suffering. And that's a blessing, because it means God hasn't left us alone. Now, we don't always know what the Holy Spirit is doing in us through suffering. 
And the truth is we might never know in this life. But if we look at it from the perspective of heaven, through faith, we can trust and know and be certain that in the middle of all of our wrestles, God is working and will work his purpose for us, in us. And ultimately, he's making us more like Jesus. And that's faith, isn't it? Faith is choosing to trust God and what he says more than we trust our own experience. And so we need to determine to exercise and have and choose faith now together today for when we go through suffering. We need to help each other remember that as a local church regularly, through all of those things Richard told us last week, praying together, showing hospitality to each other, using our gifts to serve each other, we need each other to remind each other of this. God is doing something in us in the middle of our pain. So when we suffer, we can rejoice because we share in Christ's sufferings and because God is working in us through it. But there's a third reason Peter gives us to rejoice and it's because God is working through us in it. God is working through us in it. Verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear the name. You see, when we suffer, we can praise God because it is giving us a unique chance to bear the name of Christian, of Christ followers, as this word means here in 1 Peter. We get to bear that name in front of a world that is watching us. When we suffer, we get to represent Jesus to the world around us through how we suffer. And we should never underestimate the witness that our trust in God as we suffer for following him is to those who see it because it is completely countercultural. you see the world around thinks that our faith in god is a crutch that makes us feel good and so they expect us to be a bit more like job's wife when suffering comes just to which she says in job are you still maintaining your integrity curse god and die you see to the eyes of unbelief suffering is evidence that there is no god and actually if there is a god he's just a monster So cursing God and choosing to die is the only logical conclusion. But us trusting God through suffering is an incredible witness to the world around that he is real and that he sustains us and he cares for us and that we trust him more than we trust anything else. How we suffer is a powerful witness. A few weeks ago I mentioned the book tortured for Christ and in it the way that Christians endure torture for their faith and still praise God and prayed for their persecutors well it ends up being a powerful witness to their torturers of the reality of their faith in Christ and incredibly many of those torturers have saved themselves and joined them in prison let's never underestimate what God can do through you in your suffering and so let's never ever think that to be a good witness We have to be sorted and strong and coping well and have everything right. That just could not be further from the truth. God doesn't call us to look strong to be able to bring people to him. No, he calls us to look weak in ourselves to show how strong he is in us and through us. He calls us to rely on him no matter what. And that means not being afraid of our weakness and our hurt and our confusion and our fear. See, a Christianity that's presented only in our own strength when we look good and feel good, that's not a Christianity the world needs to see. Because all they're going to see is our strength when what they need to see is our saviour. So when we suffer, it gives us a unique chance to be a unique witness to the world around us. Suffering is a powerful opportunity to bear the name of Christ in front of a world that needs to see him in and through our weakness let's not be afraid to be weak let's not be afraid to admit our suffering let's not be stiff upper lip christians stoics that isn't what people need to see they need to see god's strength magnified through our weakness when we are weak he is strong that's what the world needs to see and so when we suffer we can rejoice we can thank god for the opportunity to show what he's doing in us 
to a world around us and he'll speak through us as we are faithful to him but the final thing that Peter wants us to remember about our suffering is that we can rejoice because God is working out his will for us because God is working out his will for us that's verses 17 to 19 now there isn't time to go into all the detail here in these verses about judgment and what Peter's talking about so I think there's references to Ezekiel Malachi and all sorts of things I can point you in the direction of some great books that will help you if you want to look into that but I want to encourage us today with verse 19 so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good now there's loads of discussion among Christians all the time about the role that God plays in our suffering but 1 Peter makes it clear there is a type of suffering suffering for obeying Christ for staying faithful to him that is God's will for us whether he causes that suffering or merely allows that suffering discuss but either way this verse makes it clear that suffering is God's will for us at times as Christians and if we suffer for the sake of being Christian we can have confidence and certain that it isn't an accidental situation it isn't a situation we're not meant to be in one we've just got to endure while we wait for God to actually get back in control of everything again but instead we can in the middle of it trust that it is God's will for us and that there is a purpose and a plan and a reason in it all suffering for following Jesus is never pointless it's never needless and it isn't a sign that God's abandoned us instead Peter tells us it's God's will for us and so that can cause us to rejoice and praise God that he's not left us alone and that there is a purpose in it so the rugby player can keep playing when he gets smashed because he knows that's part of the game and there's an end point and because his captain's going through it all with him and we know there's an end point too that's part of what all the judgment talk in verses 17 and 18 are there for to remind us of the end point of all of this the day when Christ will come back to earth and will judge the heavens and the earth and all people will give an account to him and when he'll make all things right again and wipe away every tear from every eye see again in this letter Peter is pointing us forward to the final whistle of the match to the shoreline we're swimming towards to carry on the Florence Chadwick illustration for the last few weeks to look ahead to the faithful creator that we are committing ourselves to who will one day return and make all things new and remove all suffering sorrow sickness sadness and shame and for the Christian when our being made like Christ will be finished because we'll see him face to face and we'll be made like him in the twinkling of an eye and we'll see any suffering we went through on earth was completely worth it and was never arbitrary and was always full of God's purpose and plan for us and it was good so Peter's telling us remember that now think about that now don't forget that now be ready for that now because it's the truth so choose to believe it more than you can choose to believe the lies the world and the devil are going to tell us that suffering is a sign that God is absent or suffering is a sign that God hates you or surely if God loves you he wouldn't allow you to suffer well it's the opposite of that we follow a suffering savior who calls us to take up our cross and follow him and to suffer for him because it's worth it and that leads to eternal glory so how is God calling you to suffer at the moment where is God calling you to suffer where are you avoiding suffering at the moment where is there a call to suffer that we're just running away from to sacrifice to give something up our saviour calls us to suffer to follow him and it is worth it if you're a Christian expect to suffer don't be surprised by it instead choose now to rejoice because suffering in this life reminds us that this life is not the end that eternal joy awaits us even if we go through a lifetime of suffering now so keep going suffer well don't forget the reality of what's going on that God is working in us and through our suffering 
for following him, to make us like his son so we can go and be with him one day. Suffering in this life is sharing in Christ's suffering and it reminds us that we'll one day share in his glory. Suffering in this life is often how God works in us to change us and how God works through us to change others, ultimately to make us all like Jesus. So as a church, let's be ready to suffer well. Let's encourage each other as and when we go through it because we're all going to go through it at one time or other. Let's never be ashamed of our suffering and our weakness. Let's never compromise and sin. Let's get alongside each other to help fight in this fight. And together, however we can, praise God that he doesn't leave us alone through it and that he has a purpose for us in it. Mm -hmm.